Parks within six blocks of every resident, publicly owned waterways and lakeshore, a forest canopy throughout the city, active public recreation, and independent park board. These are some of the things Minneapolitans might take for granted today. Due to the influential work of many foresighted individuals over the past 100 years, the Minneapolis park system has, through a series of innovations, evolved from Horace Cleveland's visionary plan into what is now known as the best located, best financed, best designed, best maintained public open space in America. During the late 1800s, Minneapolis was a new and growing city. Prairie, dirt roads, and grassland comprised most of the city's land. Because of the rapid growth along the Mississippi River, due to the booming milling industry, Minneapolis began to become densely populated. Fortunately, there were foresighted individuals who wanted to see the city's natural beauty preserved. And the city of Minneapolis had not been too big on the idea of holding aside big tracts of land for parks. The city of Minneapolis itself wanted to develop the land into residential real estate that paid property taxes. In response to rapid industrialization in the 1880s, progressives throughout America advocated a wide range of economic, political, social, and moral reforms. This awakening spread to Minneapolis when in 1883, the Minneapolis Board of Trade adopted a resolution to establish an independent park commission. The resolution was sent as a bill to the Minnesota State Legislature, which held a referendum that was voted upon and approved by the citizens. And the legislature, late at night, uh, created a special government for the park district and put in charge uh, the people that uh, wanted so much to have parks were thereafter elected. The Park Act gave the Commission the right to acquire and improve new lands, issue city bonds, and raise park funds through taxes. The city didn't like it at the time. Uh, and it was a combination, I think, of the fact that there were very strong leaders that wanted parks, and there were very wily uh, people that understood the political system that created this system. And it, it rarely happened, uh, you know, in big cities. We, we control our system. We're elected directly by the population. We actually pass our own tax. We can pass our own laws. We hire our own superintendent. And, you know, we have our own park police force. We have our own forestry. And because of the independence is why we're very different. Around the country, there are almost no independent boards. In fact, I think in the U.S., we may be the only truly independent board in any major city. And so you see a lot of people who wish they were like our system. A lot of it is our independence and our power to do what we want to do, which is very unique. This unique structure allowed independent decision-making so the board could efficiently oversee a diverse system of parkland. One of the first acts of the newly established board and its president, Charles M. Loyne, was to engage the services of two well-known landscape architects of the time, Horace Cleveland and Frederick Law Olmsted. Horace Cleveland contributed to the Minneapolis parks by making maps and layouts of what he envisioned the park system to look like. Cleveland was hired to create a system of connected parks that would later be called the Grand Rounds. From 1878 until his death in 1900, Horace Cleveland completely revised the park system plans for Minneapolis. You know, a lot of cities 100 years ago didn't have elaborate park systems. And so here you've got the more well-to-do people setting up this great this park system because they wanted to acquire land and they didn't want the, the city council to control it. Olmsted was the designer of Central Park in New York City. Both he and Cleveland advised purchasing parklands well in advance of the need for a park. Look forward for a century to the time when the city has a population of a million and think what will be their wants. They will have wealth enough to purchase all that money can buy, but their wealth cannot purchase a lost opportunity or restore a natural feature of grandeur and beauty. The board acted on their advice, acquiring large areas of land that would have been very expensive, if even available, in later years. They were able to do this in large part through the work of pioneering benefactors like Charles Loring. They uh, issued bonds and used their crafty, clever ways they learned in business and the contacts that they had to acquire big pieces of land around the lakes and to hold open big places away from development. And it all started back in the 1880s, and it was part of the accumulation of land that started actually right in our neighborhood around Lake Erie and Lake Calhoun. 
where they started acquiring an awful lot of land. William Falwell was the first president of the University of Minnesota. As president of the park board, he was also a proponent of playgrounds for children and playing fields and parks before those activities were widely considered appropriate in parks. We owe it to our children and all future dwellers in Minneapolis to plan on a great and generous scale. If we fail to accomplish, let them know it was not for lack of ideas or ideals. William Falwell Considered the father of the park system in Minneapolis, Charles Loyne would buy land and rent it out, which gained him considerable wealth. Through many donations and acquisitions of property, Loyne used his influence to purchase the land surrounding the chain of lakes, which are Harriet, Calhoun, and Lake of the Isles. Lake Nokomis and Lake Hiawatha, as well as the shoreline of Minnehaha Creek, were also obtained. These lakes were the most used parkland, which helped the board realize their importance. It was unusual for land to be set aside for public use, and the Minneapolis Park System's job was to do this. One of the major players in accomplishing this was Theodore Worth. Theodore Worth was a horticulturist, professional park planner, and administrator who emigrated to the U.S. in the late 1880s from Switzerland. Brought to Minneapolis in 1905 by Loring to be the park superintendent, he stayed on until 1935, the year he retired. The traditional view of parks was that they should be established first for their beauty and secondly for passive recreation. However, by the time Worth arrived in Minneapolis, he strongly believed in the establishment of playgrounds and for the use of parks for active forms of recreation. He tore down fences that surrounded Minneapolis park turf areas and put up signs reading, Please walk on the grass, to emphasize his belief that parks were to be used by the people. With Worth in office, the park board gained 87 properties, $15.6 million in value, and 3,431 acres of land in only 29 years. Worth made effective use of the Elwell Law passed in Minnesota in 1911. The Elwell Law allowed for bonds to be issued for the acquisition and improvement of parks, paid for by assessing those who lived close to and who benefited from the park. The idea was just to create parks uh, within every neighborhood of the city. And so what the Elwell Law does is it allows you to condemn land, and then they would take the cost of that, whatever it costs to do that, and they would assess all the homeowners in the area. Worth visited neighborhood groups throughout the city, presenting plans of what could be provided in their area with estimates of cost. By agreeing to Worth's plan, a neighborhood park became a reality within two years. This creative new approach was a key to Worth's success in Minneapolis. Between 1920 and 1924, 26 projects were made possible through this law. Once the park system uh, began to build uh, it itself, I think the, the city was greatly benefited. And there's no city in the country that has a community center within six blocks of every home like we do. But I think in general, the park system has been an amenity for the city. It's been one of the reasons why particular parts of the city have retained their vitality in such a, in such a strong way for so long. Go. When you think about all the trees in the city, if you look at early pictures 130 years ago, South Minneapolis is pretty bare. You never see anywhere near the number of trees you do. That's from the Minneapolis Park Board. But I think that in the first 50 years of existence, it was filled with power and purpose, and it was not afraid to fight for what it wanted to do. And that's pretty rare, I think. I have had the privilege of being born in Minneapolis, a block away from Linden Hills Park. The Minneapolis Park System has made a major impact on my life through its many forms of recreation. Without the park system, I do not think my family and the families around our neighborhood and over 15 million park users yearly would be living in the same quality of life, nor would Minneapolis have the same appeal. By creating an independent board separate from city government and dedicated to park policy, by saving and preserving its scenic treasures before they would be lost by development, by finding creative and new ways to create and fund new parks, by ensuring equal access to parks for all areas of the city, guaranteeing a park within every six blocks of its residents. By planting and maintaining boulevard trees, creating a forest canopy on former prairie sites, and by creating recreational opportunities for all its citizens, Minneapolis's groundbreaking park system has developed one of the most prized park systems in America.